Hello, this is the Duchess of Elbert, Sue, and welcome to The Far Away Nearby, a show about a nerd and an intellectual sharing experiences and laughs along the way. With us today is DJ Starsage. And how are you today, DJ? I'm doing well, Sue. How have you been doing? Not too bad. Things could always be better, but then things can always be better. So <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just go with that. <laughs> exactly. We will start out our show as usual by talking about how our weeks were. And so how has your lead week been? Okay. Well, recently, I would say the uh, I've been busy with the candy shop. Things have been up and down, and there's been a change for the better, although it's not a constant change. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about work and a little bit about my personal life, as, as per usual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so at the candy shop, it's been very hectic recently because we got a bunch of new employees oh, a few months ago, and they were rushed through training. And these people, uh, if you'll pardon the, the uh, terminology, uh, these folks, they were hired to do the same job as me. So they're mm-hmm. supposed to be my counterparts. And, well, they were rushed through training, so... They uh, don't. They they didn't get to learn as much as I did when it was my turn, and it seems that they're making quite a few mistakes. And well, whoever is in charge made the decision that these fine folks don't have to take phone calls, but <laughs> I do. And so, of course, the lion's share of my phone calls are the mistakes that my new counterparts have been making in droves and these calls are back to back and management can't seem to see what the problem is when it just feels like you can do no right because your day is spent fixing their mistakes and I don't know what the possibility is of them learning from their mistakes if they don't have to face them vis-a-vis taking a phone call from the angry customer. So, uh, <laughs> but there, there has been a little light in the tunnel in that management has decided that they are going to try to make good on a promise they made a few months back in that my office is not supposed to be taking phone calls now that our department is expanded. Mm. And there's been some growing pains with that because, of course, we have some people taking phone calls, but they are also new. Yeah. But that is supposed to be their task, is that they're only supposed to take calls. It's taken a while for them to understand that they do have enough people to take phone calls. And those of us who've been around for a while are best utilized doing orders because we don't make the amount of mistakes the new people do. Yeah. And anybody can answer a phone call. Well, so, yes, this is, well, I don't know that that's necessarily true. <laughs> well, but, you know, it, it's it's just, it's it's not fair for you to expect your seasoned employees to have to, to answer for the mistakes of complete new hires. Well, this is true. Uh, so, it's, but there are a lot of things that corporations do that aren't fair, as and, as you can attest to oh, from, from the many jobs you have had. Part of the the environment, the atmosphere per se, having been in a corporate environment like that, you want to say to management, you're cultivating a hostile environment here. Yeah. You're making people not want to work here because there is no reward in coming to work because your skills are not being utilized. And so I just basically made the argument, why should I be having to take back-to-back calls and do half of the volume of work that I used to be able to when I was told we weren't supposed to be taking calls anymore? So, yeah. But that has improved in that management has decided that they're going to let us go through these order queues where we basically do sort of quality checks And our billing system decides, well, this order has something wrong, so the system's not going to allow it to close out. 
And here's a little error message here that says, I need to be fixed before I'll cooperate. So for those of us who've been there a while, part of our reward of not taking the calls is that instead of having to take the calls and fix the problem, we can be part of the back end where it's a report and you just go from one order to the next without having to have someone breathe down your neck. And it's pretty systematic because there's only so many kinds of errors that can be on these things. So you just go in there and you're like, okay, this is what's wrong with this one. This is what's wrong with this one. These all seem to have the same problem, or maybe this one's just a little different. And so it's just a handful of different remedies, if you will, to fix that particular order. So, Yeah, but, well, did uh, somebody go back to the people who originate these and explain their issues? It seems that when there is a trend of that particular problem, they're able to pull reports, but it just seems like for the most part, unless they make a big mistake, these things don't get brought back to those folks. That's terrible because they're just going to keep making it and they're going to, and if you ever have to call them up and talk to them about it, they're going to argue with it. We always oh, yeah. do it this way. Exactly. Well, and um, that sounds real shitty. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, poopy. But um, <laughs> the Duchess is one to speak her mind. Um, they they do allow us in a, I guess, constructive criticism manner to reach out to the reps if you notice a trend. Mm. So. Um, I, I am well aware of how to do a screenshot and send yeah. an email that includes <laughs> a certain person's boss. And, yeah. of course, that certain person's boss is just a, a helpful reminder that maybe you should get around to doing this or learning this because um, it's been pointed out. But, yeah. So um, That sounds reasonable. Mm-hmm. You know, that that was our argument as well, is that if they don't take phone calls, how are they ever going to learn that they're causing these mistakes? Well, yeah, so. I, and, if they, and if nobody ever points out to them what the mistakes are, they're going to just keep doing it the same way. Mm-hmm. So they so, think that's how it's supposed to be done. Exactly. So it, it was nice to know that, you know, the, op- that the option is there, that management is realizing a lot of people are getting burned out. I was just very pleasantly surprised after we had our meeting the other week that like the next day, my manager, not my supervisor, but my manager lady that ran the meeting Mm -hmm. basically said, after you're done with that call, you can go ahead and work on one of these reports. And I'm like, Oh, can I please? (laughs) It was, it's like, um, Kind of reminds me of a scene from one of my favorite 80s movies. It had Dan Aykroyd, and um, I'm forgetting her name now, but, you know, a blonde bombshell type. Yeah. And it was called um, My Stepmother is an Alien. And oh, yeah, I remember. I, I remember this. Mm-hmm. And basically, she came from an advanced civilization, but they had, they had forgotten how to have fun. And when he asks her, when Dana Aykroyd's character asks her what they did for fun, she says math. And then what he asks her what they do to unwind. And she's like graphs and charts. (laughs) 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 So, but yes, that was work. And uh, just continuing on for a moment longer as the summertime is, is prone to, to be, it's replete with family obligations, and oh, yes. <laughs> recently I attended a family reunion, which was for my mother's side of the family. Oh. Now, um, mother's been gone for a few years, but her youngest sister is still with us, and she is essentially the matriarch of that that side of the family. Well, yeah. And uh, so she's taken upon herself to organize a family reunion for what would have been her dad's side. And it's interesting because growing up on my mother's side of the family, we always had a reunion for my grandmother's side and my grandfather's side and it alternated years or so it would seem. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I've, I've organized reunions for my dad's side because we didn't know our cousins growing up on that side since my grandparents divorced before I was born. Yeah. But um, anyways, we went to a reunion for my mother's family and it was 
eye-opening because as a child, you don't pay attention to, you know, this is your grandmother's sister or her brother or, you know, however many cousins and relations you have. <laughs> And, well, at least you try not to. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you only remember if there were other kids there your age that you could play with, you know. Yeah. But, but, um, if, but if it was only once a year, I didn't always remember the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just I knew there were kids there that were kind of fun. And I knew essential. We we had a an annual reunion that uh, for some relatives that were distant relatives of my father. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea why we had that, but but they ran. I mean, we we went to this every year. It was once a year. It was at the same place. It was held by the same woman who was like a fifteenth cousin or something. I mean, oh, I don't think quite that far, but she was a distant cousin of my father's. Mm-hmm. And I don't know exactly. And everybody there was like. A, some kind of a distant relative of my father's, but there were no brothers, there were no sisters, there were no, you know, first cousins or anything. It was, all these people were like, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, they, they were so mixed up that the woman who who um, who ran it, who organized it and had it, and she had this really nice place outside of Boulder, mm-hmm. and or just on the edge of Boulder, I'm not sure it was quite outside, but, and, and she had lots, of, and she had empty property, so she had like a couple lots of just yard, and that's where the family reunion was, and then she had this humongous house uh, that had been built probably in the late 1800s or early 1900s, and, and people went out and got their paper plates and found a place to sit down and eat, whether it was outside or or uh, somewhere in the house, they encouraged everybody under 18 to eat outside. <laughs> oh. they, didn't they didn't think we were very neat and tidy. Ah, uh, okay. I was going to say, were they they passing around the uh, the jug there? No, <laughs> no I don't think so. I just think they, they just, uh, you know, they wanted the kids to eat outside. And I think they wanted the older kids to eat outside to make sure that nobody ran off and got lost. Okay. It would be real. It would have been real easy to do that, but that's. Mm-hmm. But I. So I think that sometimes when you get into those situations, especially when they are not direct relatives, right? That they it can be hard to and confusing. And if it's only once a year or every few years, you don't have reunions every year, do you? Um, you say that. Not recently. When I was growing up, it was more regular, but uh, I do believe that they alternated back and forth because my grandparents grew up in a small town area, and Mm -hmm. they had many cousins that would marry the other's family. So, um, you know, so it wasn't a coincidence that you had a couple that were – you know, married to the same two families as your grandparents because they were cousins of each other when they met, you know, Ah. different, different families, but that's when they would meet because you would go to a church event or something and, you know, Oh, well, this is my cousin's, you know, wife's family or whatever. And so, but I, the thing I remember the most, and this is terrible, it's, it's the mind of a child, but, you know, you, you remember growing up and going to these reunions and they were in rural Pennsylvania. And I just remember that we would go to, I think they were state parks and mm-hmm. um, they certainly had modern conveniences, but as a child, you don't think of, but because it was a state park, it, it wasn't running water in the sense of plumbing. They had toilets that would just dump out like they were, you know, chemical toilets or something. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's a state park, they want to conserve water. But yes. as a kid, you didn't think that. You thought, oh, well, you know, they're backwards back here. It's rural <laughs> PA. They don't have, you know, indoor plumbing. And it was just a state park. But anyways, that, that was my grandparents' side of the family. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But at this reunion, it was an interesting experience as an adult because I met all these relations that were, you know, my grandmother's or my grandfather. Actually, my, it's, this case was my grandfather's side of the family. Just as things progressed history-wise, they all had daughters. So, of course, now the family name is all but gone. 
And yeah. there was a gentleman there who was a little older than my eldest sister. He was a very unique individual. I wanted to spend more time with him because, number one, he showed up to the reunion on a motorcycle. Oh, well, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, had long hair and tattoos and, of course, the you know quintessential motorcycle guy clothing. But oh, yeah, yeah. very down-to-earth guy. I got to talking about our trip overseas last summer, and he talked about when his company had sent him overseas. And coming to find out, this cousin of mine is the only male in that part of the family, so he is quite literally the the namesake now. <laughs> Does he have any children at all? He has daughters. He has daughters, so, too. <laughs> yes. So, you know, the, the, the he fate... Could just, a, he could the, adopt a son. Right, or, you know, if that were the case, I would have just named the, the child with the last name, you know, as the first thing. Yeah. I mean, my, my husband's middle name is his mother's maiden name. Well, yeah, with, that's not uncommon, I think. It got him some attention growing up because he was raised Catholic. And as a Catholic, your middle name is supposed to be a saint name. Oh, I, well, I don't know about that. I know that when they are go through confirmation, they get a saint name. Because mm-hmm. Catholics usually have at least four names. They have their the name they were they were given at birth, which is the first, middle, and last name. And then when they are confirmed, they they take a saint's name as another middle name. And apparently, they do that also in uh, in 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 Europe. It, okay. It's common, or at least in I shouldn't say in Europe. In Germany, it mm-hmm. is common to give a child. Uh, four names, one of which is a saint, oh. and usually one is some other relative, but but it's not always. It may just be, you know, like or, or summertime or something, you know. Well, uh, but for the might, purposes of, of anyone who's interested in genealogy, it's quite a help because if you don't know much about a certain side of your family and you're looking for records, you find somebody that has, like, a grandfather's name. You yeah. Know, y- you you get the suggestion that this is more than likely the people that you're researching because the name has been continued, for example. Yeah. So this very unique gentleman is the namesake of the family. And I recently, as far as like the last six months, not in the last few weeks, I recently learned that my grandfather's grandmother went by a very different name after marriage than that she was born with. Now, I think that probably has something to do with the fact that she came from a family that might have had as many as 12 or 13 kids. And, (laughs) you know, she went from being Susan Pamelia Jane to just Jenny. Yeah. And um, so it was interesting to research her and I found her death certificate which helped me learn about that side of the family and then I learned that much like my father's side where we've been here much longer than we ever believed on my mother's side my family has actually been in America since before it was a country so (laughs) so that's that's something briefly I was going to mention I was listening to an episode of Greetings from Nowhere recently Mm-hmm. And I believe it was Christina on that show that talked about doing her family tree. And she mm-hmm. learned that on her father's side of the family, similarly, that they had been here so long that they'd been here for the American Revolution. And so that's something where now, and I mentioned this to the re, in the reunion, and my aunt was kind of thrilled about it. She said, I, you know, I've never had anything special like this before. I feel like I've won a prize or something. Basically, <laughs> you know, she can apply for membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution. Well, now is she on the right side of the American Revolution? You know? Yes, in this case, it would be because, uh, as I I, 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 we've learned that in some respects, German. Well, they wouldn't be colonists, I guess, but German settlers were for hire in some respects by the king of germany as an ally of england so if you if any of our listeners happen to have german heritage you may learn if you do some digging that 
your family may not have been on the quote unquote right side of the law at the time. <laughs> well, when when my aunt, my mother's youngest sister, decided she wanted to join the DAR, mm-hmm. so she started. This is how she got interested in history. Oh, and so uh, she went searching back for those things, and uh, what she found out, she she found relatives back there at, at the time of the American Revolution, and I assume they would have been here before the American Revolution, because you don't just come over. Well, you don't usually just come over for a war. Uh, unless I, you're for hire, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless you're probably, you know, like the Hessians or somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but um, so they lived in the new, I think it was in the New York area. It might have been in the Pennsylvania area. It's hard for me. I, I don't remember real well because I have not really cared a whole lot about that. And I seem to have lost her notebook about that, about to, that where she had all the stuff that about the family, mm-hmm. which is really annoying. But anyway, getting back to, to my story is that they, she, she found a whole bunch of people back there that were related to us. And one person was hanged. Um, oh. so the family went to Canada and when they came back, they couldn't get their land back because they had been on the wrong side. They were they were voting for the they were hoping for the English to continue, and of course, the English did not continue. The English right. got kicked out because it, as the United States learned in Vietnam and it's learning in the Middle East, it is very difficult to fight a, a long distance war, and that was a really long distance war. At the time, I think in World War II, it, it wasn't quite as long distance, but but at the American Revolution, it was really far and hard for them to fight. I, uh, as a fan of genealogy, I've watched. I, I want to say that it's the the Learning Channel now. It was at one point NBC or ABC that did the show called "Who Do You Think You Are," hmm. and um, in more recent years, one of the seasons they had. Melissa Etheridge as a guest on there. Yes. And when they researched her family tree, it was quite interesting because if I'm remembering correctly, she had an ancestor that had settled in what is now the Midwest. And I think it might've been Kentucky or somewhere. And um, because of the territory that they were in, the, um, the occupation had switched hands about three times Mm-hmm. And so they went from speaking English to speaking French to back to English again. <laughs> I only thought they did that in Europe. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but anyways, um, you know, so my, my aunt is thrilled because now she feels that she's won something that has made her interesting. And I'm excited for her. And It's true. I think that even when I was a child, people who had relatives that were here, prior to the revolution were something special because they're they're like amongst the founding fathers right you know if your relatives came over about the time of the civil war to get out of the uh out of a war in europe and ended up fighting (laughs) civil war because they couldn't speak english you know that was the only thing they could do but um but they came over you know if if you're if you if you are relative if your ancestors are, are those kind of people or the uh, the Irish that came over from the from the potato famine or you know if you're escaping something in your country and you come over here as a refugee it doesn't feel quite as special as if you came over as an indentured servant and were here you know thirty years before the revolution. Mm-hmm. And then your kids, when you're old and tired and you finally got out of your indentured servitude and and you're and you're trying to make your way and you get married and have kids and and, you know, there's something special about that. I'm Absolutely. talking about the servitude because I don't know anybody who has relatives that were, you know, <laughs> like real founding father types. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody I know is. <laughs> I, I uh, it's you know like I said I'm excited for my aunt because she needs a social outlet. She is mm-hmm. a a single well she's a divorcee. Her daughters are both old enough that they've left home. Yeah. And she's changed jobs often enough that 
I, I don't think that she has many friends outside of work. Yeah. And, you know, she doesn't live near where her children were when they were younger. Yeah. So, but anyways, I'm excited for her. I wish I could have the same enthusiasm for myself because I, I like the idea of that type of, you know, a organization. Yeah, but I don't know if they have a Sons of the American Revolution. There is, actually. It's just oh, really? that, um, yeah, there's the Sons and there's also the Daughters. However, the Sons seem to be a couple of decades behind in web design. You can actually go to the daughter's webpage and look up your ancestor and their service record, whereas the sons, their page looks like something on Angel Fire from the 90s. <laughs> but anyways, if, if, I were to, if I were to express interest in joining the sons, I'm <laughs> kind of on the wrong side of politics because, sadly, one of the things that the sons of the American Revolution seem to be aligned with is the concept of being a modern day Minuteman and taking up arms and Oh God, they haven't they they have the sons of the American Revolution have joined the uh the the border patrol? I, I think that it's very akin to that type of um oh, you God, know, you mindset. Them, turn them around. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I would love to somehow create a new sons of the revolution. Yeah. But the word revolution seems to imply that you want to overthrow government. So um, maybe, it, maybe it should be more generalized and patriotic because in this day and age, there should be an organization that blends the sexes. Well, yes, I would, I would think that too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that the, the reason they differentiated the, like the daughter's, because women didn't, you know, there was like what one woman that actually went to war. Mm-hmm. She, I, th- I do believe there was one woman that went to war with her husband and she dressed up like a man and she behaved like a man and she did all of that stuff so that she and her husband could. I, and I don't remember if they both made it through or not, but that was a very unusual thing. And I think that that was there was just one woman that actually went to war, although there was. Uh, we had women nurses at the time, and not as many as we had during the Revol- or the Civil War, I think. But there were there were women. That was when we started nursing our soldiers mm-hmm. in this country. So um, I've gone on a, a while now about my uh, my week. Um, Sue, uh, how was your week? Was well, there my, anything interesting? My week was sort of an up and down week. I. I once again have been sick. I don't know if there's something about the place I live or there's something about summer in this country that seems to make me ill. Oh, no. <laughs> but uh, the first summer we moved over to this apartment because we changed apartments last last summer. About, I don't know, it was in August, I think. Uh, I think I got bit by a spider and then I got sick for like three, four months. Oh. And I just didn't want to do anything. And this month, I did, or this year, I didn't get bit by a spider. But off and on, all summer, I've been kind of, you know, I don't want to do anything. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I have diarrhea. I, you know, all of the nasty things that go with being sort of sick. And they, I go to the doctor and they hand me, a, you know, they go, we'll go and buy some, um, what is that stuff that, uh, uh, a motor, uh, I, I can't remember, the, the little pills you could take. Ivory and, okay, and and go on a and go on a uh, you know and drink Metamucil every day. It will sort of even even, even things out. And I'm going, I can't stand Metamucil. I can't <laughs> drink it, and it makes me throw up. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> I know that it's good for people, and I try and eat a well balanced diet and include lots and lots of fiber mm-hmm. because that's what Metamucil does for you. I think right. But I just don't understand. How, and my doctor, when when she told me to do this, she says, "Oh, it's changed. It's so much better." Well, it's not. It hasn't changed at all. Because <laughs> every few years, I try and do this because I know it's supposed to be good for me. Mm-hmm. And people recommend it. Not only do doctors, but people that you know and love and respect, you know, tell you that if you do that, if you drink that every morning, you'll have no problems. You'll just be 
and I don't believe him. It's it it is torture. It is something evil. It tastes terrible. It makes people want to throw up. I don't see how anybody can stand it. Well, and putting it in flavored and flavored things <laughs> is even worse because that's one of the things they say. Oh, put it in orange juice or apple juice. You know, you put it in orange juice. There's already you know there's already fiber. You know, the pieces of orange and stuff in there. Well, it is not any better. It is just makes the orange juice terrible. Well, they they make tums in different flavors too. Doesn't make you want to put it in a shot glass. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Although the tums they have they have actually improved upon the original. You can go back. Well, it's hard to do in this country, but you can go back and do it do the original, you know, how they originally got that, because what you're taking with Tums and those kind of things is chalk, Mm -hmm. which absorbs the acid in your stomach, Uh, except that Tums has has smoothed this thing out, and they've made it taste good, and and it's not. But my friend from Germany drinks dirt, and she calls it dirt. I have no idea what it's called in German, but... She translates it as to be dirt. <laughs> I just visualized the name dirt with the two little umlaut dots over a U. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I don't know, but but anyway, and and I have been I have been at her house when I haven't felt well and she has given me this stuff and you can kind of choke it down. It is easier to choke down the metamucil, let me tell you. But it is kind of it's kind of gritty and it's sort of like dirt. And it looks like dirt. You mix it up in a glass, and it and it doesn't, you know, totally mix. It doesn't make like mud. I don't know. It's more of a clay like thing, I think, than it is. But it's it's crushed up, and it it is a little gritty. But you mix it up in a small amount of water, a teaspoon or some of it, and, and you drink it down. And it's it's a little, you know, I can I can get almost all of it down. Mm-hmm. And for diarrhea, they use coal. Huh. <laughs> it's so interesting, and, now, and and it works, but it's really it's really weird. You you take this this powdered coal, which mm-hmm. you mix into water, and it looks like little chunks of coal. If you've ever dealt with coal in your life, you would recognize this, and you drink it down, and that's kind of hard to choke down too. But it it also works. But we have things in this country that taste much better than that and much easier to use no it, it seems like that the more modern train of thought when it comes to digestive issues and i don't know if this is something that they've tried to push on you as well is um well you know you've seen the commercials with jamie lee curtis right oh, there's yes, that yes. magical yogurt that we're supposed to be able to eat and it turns everything right around I have not tried that. I, I have wondered if I did that instead. I didn't ask my doctor about that, hmm. uh, about if they if I ate that instead of the Metamucil, if that would help. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should try it. Maybe. And I, I would say, only because you've mentioned before being diabetic, I would check the labels first, though, because um, somebody who has tried to make a change for better – yeah. I've noticed that a lot of everyday things have a lot more sugar content than you would think. Like all of the yogurts that are out there that claim that they're oh so wonderful for you, and you look at the ones that claim to have a good amount of protein, but mm-hmm. they typically have the same level of protein as they do sugar. So let's mm-hmm. say it's got 12 grams of protein. Oh, wonderful. Well, how much sugar? 12 grams of sugar too? Yeah, well, one of the things that you can look at, and and um, and all anything that says it's low fat or or any or diet foods, I do not eat diet foods because diet foods are not good for you. Mm-hmm. They're evil. They taste funny, and they have crap in them. I, I just I want to eat real food. I, I, I don't want to eat whatever that stuff is. Um, but if you look at at them, they'll say that they're it's low fat, and they've taken you know they've they have reduced all of that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Well, what they've done is they put sugar in, right? Because they can put less sugar and get less calories and perk that up. Because mm-hmm. when I was diagnosed with diabetes, they had me talk to a nurse practitioner in the office that had that sort of she did counseling on um, on dietary things if you had if whatever you had if it called for a special diet she Mm -hmm. she was your go-to person right and the first thing she said is you know 
you, if you eat yogurt, because I do eat a lot of yogurt, you got to eat the dietary stuff, you know, the low, low fat stuff. And I'm going, ain't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff tastes terrible and it's got sugar in it. And I'm not going to do it. I don't think it's better for you. Yeah. And she said, well, then you should only eat plain yogurt. And of course, I I always buy I, I always buy yogurt that is active. It has active and is active whatever it is. Yeah, the, probiotics. That, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that that kind of stuff. Because if it's, if it's live and it doesn't stay live very well, I used to make yogurt. I think my um, mother did use it too when I was a kid. It's pretty easy to do. You just put milk on. You put milk on the stove. Mm-hmm. You heat it very gently until it is just about to boil. You take, a, depending on how much milk you have, you take a tablespoon or two of live yogurt and mix it into that. You put it into a jar. You wrap it in a towel. I put mine in a towel-lined cooler that okay. you take, like, in summer. Mm-hmm. I put that, I, 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 I stuff towels and blankets or whatever I had loose that was, you know, in there. So that it was completely full of of covering, and okay. then pop on it just like you would if you were taking it to the park for for drinks or something. And I left it like twenty four, forty eight hours, whatever, and I had yogurt. Hmm. The problem was that I had yogurt and lots of yogurt because you want to make it every three days because that's how about how long the live yogurt oh are. yeah yogurt is live and they start to die then. Mm-hmm. And so on the fourth day, they're not really very good. <laughs> you know, it, I, I mean, it, it doesn't change taste or anything because yogurt will last a long time. Right. But it's just not the thing that you that you want to do. So I just don't I, I only eat real food. I, I but I, and I have also I haven't made yogurt for a while, but I thought about it. So you uh, you were saying that your week had you not feeling so well. Okay. And I would say, of course, that would be the low point of your week. What was the high point? I'm not sure that I had a high point. I expected to go over and celebrate my oldest granddaughter's 21st birthday. And on her birthday, but this past week when her birthday was, her family all had strep throat. So they sort of didn't invite me to their house because I am susceptible to all kinds of germs and that kind of stuff and i was sick anyway and they didn't really maybe i made them sick <laughs> oh. <laughs> i don't know but i just I, I i did think that it was convenient that they have strep no- throat now because in about a week and a half mm-hmm. they are going to start university again so no i don't yeah. know if exactly a week and a half it's on the 15th it may just be a week away i'm not sure mm-hmm. so you didn't really have a high point to your i week. didn't i don't think i really had a high point so okay. we should probably advance to the to our topics okay and what did you want to talk about this week i discovered an interesting story an article unlike usual i found this through another site um, Billy likes to watch the History Channel with me, and oh, we yeah. both like the Indiana Jones style stories. You know, archaeology. <laughs> that yeah. was that was one of my favorite aspects of the character of Captain Picard on Star Trek: The Next yeah. Generation. Was that it was mentioned before that if he had not gone into Starfleet, that he might have been an archaeologist. Yeah. And now and then that. Um, resurfaced in the show he would get to go off and have an adventure so this particular website likes to focus on the news of discoveries in archaeology and it's archaeologica with an a dot is it org i think but anyways let's see because they also have a podcast yeah archaeologica.org and this particular story was from well a week or two ago, perhaps. But the story is Vikings were buried with board games to beat boredom. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, that sounds kind of funny. Vikings are big, boisterous people that kill you. Yeah, so I'll just read a little bit about this. It says Vikings were buried with board games to make sure they are entertained in the afterlife to prevent them from returning to haunt the living, experts believe. (laughs) 
It says the Orkney <laughs> Islands were under Norwegian rule until the 15th century, acting as a foothold for Viking raids on mainland Britain. The islands remained littered with archaeological evidence of the feared Norse warriors, including at least two burial sites where board games were found to have been buried alongside bodies. <laughs> and the article goes on to say, now a Scots academic has revealed that they were included in a bit to commemorate the warrior skill of the deceased and to provide them with an entertainment in the afterlife. So that would be well, interesting. I, I wonder yeah. if, there, if there were... <laughs> You know, I wonder what kind of board games that they would have had if they would have had, you know, different ones. And I'm not, um, I mean, well, partially because our house is, is under remodel, but, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have a whole lot of people that, you know, want to hang out after work because I live in the hinterlands. But right. we, we have a fair, a fair starter set of board games and whatnot that we hope to get to. Yes doesn't like to play board games and I'm really not very big on it so mm -hmm. we don't have a selection of it although we did buy one shortly after we got married we bought a game that had it was a board game of something it was it's sort of like civilization where you go and and you create civilization and you and you raise people up and eventually you become have sophisticated civilization like we have now mm -hmm. but <laughs> But at the very beginning, you started out as scum of the earth. Oh. <laughs> and and throughout this, you could always end up going back to being scum of the earth. You know, oh. you could always get set back to that. And I just, I, I don't know why, just that whole idea of, 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 of having to play as scum of the earth, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> And I think eventually we gave it. To, we gave her all our board games. We had trivia, and I used to like to sit around it and read the back of the cards. <laughs> oh, what was it that you wanted to talk about this oh, week? I have had a number of. Well, we moved a year ago, and we've. Uh, my husband and I have had a tendency to live in apartments for you know wherever we live. We lived there for a number of years, uh, and till something happens or. Or for some reason, we decide we want to move. Uh, but recently, besides our moving last year, recently, I've had a number of friends here in town that, that moved for some reason or other. And I was, I, the last one was during this last week, was pretty, which was part of my horrible week. But because I, I, of course, have difficulty saying no to people when they ask me to do something. So, of course, I do podcasts and I help people move and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and what have you. But, you know, people call me up and ask me to do something. And if I can, I try and do that. So they, I, I've been helping them move a little bit. I can't do very much because I don't, I, I don't breathe well. And they move to the third floor of a walk-up thing you know so oh <laughs> so it's so like i'm not doing very much but but i went over and helped the 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 woman arrange some set things in her kitchen and and uh then we went over and we used our car to to so that we went back to their apartment or their original apartment and got stuff and we used my car to move some of them but they didn't move because they wanted to move. They moved because they were evicted. Oh. And they were evicted because of housekeeping. Ah. The and, and Well, yeah. <laughs> I love these people. They are wonderful. I was helping my friends move. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and I think, I, I don't know them well enough to, to, to know this, but I think that... They have they have money problems. They they are not very they don't make very good income, and they are both in their mid mid sixties, mid to late sixties. Uh, so they do not have a lot of money, and and I don't have a lot of money. I mean, I don't find that as a fault, but it it has been a problem since they really are are not very good housekeepers. They moved into uh, an apartment, this apartment they moved out of that they've been there for like seven ten years or something. But they've been there quite a while, and and they finally were evicted because their housekeeping, because they their dishes weren't done, and there was food and stuff sitting around, and there was mold growing on this food, and, 
So and were, were there complaints from the neighbors? Is that what it would be? I go have with? no idea what happened. I, I really don't. I just yeah. know that they were. And I, you know, when I heard this, I'm going, oh, God, I better go home and clean my house because right. I'm like the world's worst house. Oh, well, I can only assume that in that scenario there where they've been there a number of years, you know, there was something cooking in the leasing office. They wanted to have a reason to get rid of them because, I don't know, in some places, if you've been there a while, you may be not paying as much rent as a new tenant. So, I don't know. But, I, I you know, have no, I, I have no idea. Could be a factor, but anyways. I, I felt really bad for them. I, mm. But I know that they their their housekeeping is worse than mine. That I can oh. tell. I've only been out there a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But, but I can tell that just by walking in the first time. It's like, this is not my house. This is not my mother's house. There's something wrong with this house. Yeah, it's... You know? Oh, I don't yeah. quite know what it is. It's... And I am, I am like a really bad housekeeper. And I, but that was every time that something like that happens, it's like, I, oh, I better start cleaning my house up because well, it's just terrible. That's, that's just another reason why the Duchess is a perfect name for you. Because why should you dirty your hands when you've got people for that? <laughs> it's true. And I wish that I could have people on a weekly basis. I, I do have my grandchildren allegedly come once a month and mm-hmm. help me clean do the heavy lifting kind of stuff because unfortunately you know i make too much money to to have help from the state and mm-hmm. you know hiring hiring house cleaners is really expensive oh yeah is, and, is, is it bad that i i sort of shame my husband certainly there's to be expected a, gr- a degree of chaos in a house that's under remodel but yes <laughs> certain things are, are are habit based and you know you, you you wonder did this person have a messy room as a child should i feel bad that i said you know if my grandmother were alive and saw this place she would have a stroke <laughs> Well, I don't know. It depends on how you do it. Trick it. You know, if you said it in sort of a jestful way, or you, it, 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 I oh, of course. It, what do you mean? Out in the far Out in the far Thank you for listening to the Far Away Nearby. You can find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. This show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Smart Radio. Our email is tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Or leave us a voicemail at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.